Brad, thanks for your company. We just heard there from Richard Branson. It looks like he's going to be winning the uh, race for the first billionaire into space. Yeah, look, you know, when, uh, when Jeff Bezos announced that he was going to go on July 20th uh, a few months ago, the question was always, is Elon Musk with SpaceX or Richard Branson's Virgin Galactic going to try and slide in before then? Uh, and once Richard's uh, Branson's Virgin Galactic got their federal aviation license approval, so essentially their U.S. government license that says, yep, you can take people uh, into space or at least fly them. Now, that happened a little over a week ago. Uh, it was only a matter of time if they were going to try and slip in a first flight, including with Sir Richard Branson himself on it. So not a huge surprise at all. But as you said, really important because Virgin Galactic has been working on this for 17 years. And unlike SpaceX of Blue Origin, which is also doing a whole bunch of other things, their, their focus was only space tourism. So they, they kind of had to win it. Uh, so we'll see in, I guess, uh, nine days, because it'll probably be July 12th, here in Australia, uh, if they have that first successful flight or not. Yeah, they'll be uh, crossing all their fingers and toes, hoping for no technical glitches. But let's look at some other space news now. And the biggest comet ever discovered, it's entering our solar system and already showing some signs of activity. What do we know about it so far? So most comets, if you think, you know, Halley's Comet and those sorts of things, uh, the main part of the comet is only a couple of kilometres wide. Now, as it goes through the solar system, the sun starts to heat it up and melt it, and we get those beautiful tails. Now, this comet has been measured to be between 100 and 300 kilometres, so literally 100 times bigger than most of the comets in our solar system. Now, it's on the very far edge of the solar system, slowly coming in. So as you're seeing here, it's really just going to start to pass the orbits of Neptune and then get to Jupiter and Saturn. You can kind of see Mercury, Mirth, and, and, and Mars uh, in the center there. Now, it's never going to come towards Earth. It's going to skim around the inside of our solar system. But as it does, as it reaches its closest point in uh, just under a decade, uh, it's going to be a very bright, in theory, comet. Uh, and I guess the biggest surprise here is we just never thought comets would be this big or could get this big. Uh, but as we start to image and survey the outer edges of our solar system more, maybe more of these giant comets are lurking out there. And, Brad, scientists, they've detected neutron stars being, allowed, as being swallowed rather by black holes. What can that then <laughs> tell us about the universe? So, so when stars die, uh, usually they die either through a complete explosion, but even in that complete explosion, they leave a little bit of a remnant core behind this neutron star. Now, of course, we also have our, our black holes, these things that uh, are formed from the implosion of a star. Now, for the past few years, we've been detecting these what we call gravitational waves, ripples of gravity traveling through space through massive events like black holes colliding or neutron stars colliding. Well, uh, in 2018, two of these combinations, as you're seeing here, a black hole and a neutron star colliding together were detected. Now, what's important here is we're really just trying to understand what are the kind of combinations of the ends of stars' lives that you can get. We really want to understand the complete life cycle of a star from birth to middle age like our sun to the end of its uh, life cycle. What we've really is hard to find is these neutron stars. They're only about 20 kilometers wide, sometimes 50 kilometers. They don't really have any light. They're really hard, almost impossible to detect, except through these ripples. So it's telling us a lot about how many of them there are, the sizes and the creation of them, and then therefore really what is the volume of these objects and what is the volume of stars and even dead stars in our galaxy and other galaxies. So really trying to put that complete census picture together of the life cycle of a star. Um, Brad, this one is perhaps my favourite story of today. Uh, the first laundry detergent being made to help astronauts do their laundry. I never thought you'd have to think what they actually did to clean their clothes because turns out they never did. Exactly, that's right. It's a, you know, it's a dirty job. We have this very glamorous view of space. It's not that simple. You can't really, you don't have a washing machine. Uh, as you're seeing, you know, on your screen, when you really try and pour water out, it just doesn't go anywhere. So when astronauts but the thought of wearing the same thing for a week and just being so sweat filled is disgusting. <laughs> yeah, look, it's it, it's foul. It gets stinky up there. It literally stinks in the space station, and so you can't wash it. And the past, what they've done instead of trying to wash it because it's not that easy, is they load up their week or two weeks load of stinky clothes, put them in cargo bays, and then as the empty essentially space capsule comes back to Earth and burns up upon re-entry, 
their dirty laundry burns up in the atmosphere. There's literally dirty underpants burning up in our Earth's atmosphere. It is not a necessarily pretty picture. Um, now, Tide, a, a detergent company in the U.S., is trying to create essentially a, a waterless detergent system so, A, astronauts can smell a little bit better, uh, make space travel a bit more practical, because you can't just have a, a change of clothes every day or even multiple times a day, your exercise and your lounging about clothes. So it's trying to make space a little bit more comfortable for astronauts. And one of these things, when we think about private people who are going to space, as you're seeing here, they don't want to take their dirty laundry with them. Yeah, yeah. No, it'll be interesting to see how that one pans out, particularly as more people try to get up into space. But just finally, and we are almost out of time, Brad, a new type of exploding star, it's been discovered. So this is something I'm quite excited by. When stars explode, they can either essentially implode upon themselves, they run out of fuel and implode and then causing a massive explosion. You can also get old stars that essentially vacuum clean. They suck off other stars through gravity and create a thermonuclear explosion like a bomb. Well, this new mechanism was proposed 40 years ago that actually kind of steals electrons. If you think of protons and neutrons and electrons, it steals electrons off atoms, gobbles them up, and creates a very powerful and long-lasting explosion. So it's quite exciting to say, hey, there is a new way of blowing up a star, again, one 40 years in the making, but then it'll really uh, trigger some interesting ideas about how these stars in their lives and how the universe essentially recycles itself when these explosions happen. So exciting to see how all of these uh, ends of life stories come out to play in space. Brad Tucker, thank you so much for your insights as always.